Dear ladies and gentlemen, Pani Tapanova, and we are here again with our series of conversations and interviews with intellectuals in Ukraine for those out there who are keen to learn more, think deeper, and hear from the original sources. This is already episode 26. And with you with you is the national series of conversations and interviews with intellectuals in Ukraine for those who want to know more, think deeper, and hear from the original sources. This is already episode 26. This is a project of Pan Ukraine, whose entire team is still in Ukraine, continuing their work under the extremely difficult conditions under terror and violence of Russia's continuing war against Ukraine. There are no words enough to express our admiration for their dedication and commitment. Це проєкт Pan Ukraina, вся команда якого все ще перебуває в Україні, продовжуючи свою роботу в надзвичайно складних умовах терору та насильства війни Росії проти України. Бракує слів, аби висловити наше захоплення вашою відданістю та наполегливістю. The project is co-hosted by Pan International, which has continued to provide a platform for freedom of expression for those currently under the highest risk. The project is implemented with the support of the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine, and our traditional partners are Pan America, the Ukrainian Institute, the Ukrainian Institute London, Ukraine World, Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, the Harman Institute at Columbia University, and we are streaming today's event to all partners' Facebook pages. Співорганізатором проєкту є міжнародний ПЕН, який продовжує надавати платформу для свободи вираження поглядів тим, хто перебуває в групі найвищого ризику. Проєкт втілюється за підтримки посольства США в Україні, і нашими традиційними партнерами є ПЕН Америка, Український інститут, Український інститут Лондона, Україна Світ, Український науково-дослідний інститут Гарвардського університету та інститут Гаррімана при Колумбійському університеті. Ми транслюємо сьогоднішню подію на всі партнерські сторінки у Facebook. Захід відбуватиметься англійською мовою. And I switch to English to introduce our guests. Angelina Karakina is Ukrainian journalist and editor based in Kiev. She has reported on Ukrainian political and social affairs, including the Maidan demonstrations and the conflict in eastern Ukraine for Ivory News Kyiv Bureau, and has also worked as a journalist and presenter for Hermitske, Ukrainian's major independent media outlet, where she covered the cases of Alexei Sov and Alexander Kolchin, and conducted award-winning investigative reporting stage across the half-earth, the story of the imprisonment of Sinsov and Kolchin. From 2017 to 2020, she was editor-in-chief at Gromadske. And in March 2020, she co-founded the Public Interest Journalism Lab, which seeks to popularize best practices for public interest journalism in the digital age. She's currently a media manager and head of news and Ukrainian public broadcaster. So Angelina is definitely the one at the top of Ukrainian news daily. So we are happy to have you today with us. Thank you for joining. And Angelina will talk to you, my old friend and one of the greatest journalists I know, <laughs> David Patrick Karakas, British journalist, author, and TV producer, best known as the author of War in 140 Characters, How Social Media is Reshaping Conflict in the 21st Century. It's recently been published in Ukrainian, so also you can find it in Ukrainian bookshops. But not only, he is also an author of Earlier Nuclear Iran, the birth of an atomic state and a huge number of publications for, and in the course of his career, he was written for New York Times, Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, Newspeak, The Guardian, Daily Telegraph, The Independent, The Spectator, CNN, and I will stop here, otherwise you will be tired just from listening the list. All I want to tell about his publications that they are necessary to read. I'm also delighted to remind that David was the one giving the closing keynote speech at the Pan Congress in Lviv back in 2017. He's just back from Ukraine, so I do hope he will share with us all the details. Uh, so today we will have two highly informed journalists which work with the primary sources. And we'll try to find the answers to the questions on this horrible war, its political, cultural, humanitarian, and digital context as well. And uh, but based on the extremely horrific news from Ukraine from yesterday, I would like to propose to start our conversation with a moment of silence 
honoring those who have been affected yesterday in Kremenchu. For those who are not aware, yesterday Russian missile aimed the shopping mall with about 1,000 of civilians inside. It's still difficult to realize the number of victims, but more than 400 rescuers are working to dismantle the debris. Tonight, the UN Security Council will meet to discuss this in human action. Thank you. Thank you, David, also for joining us. And I will pass the floor to you, wishing you a great conversation. And um, let's find out on the progress of, those, of this war and the last news and everything you want to share with our viewers all around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Thank you again for the invite. As always a pleasure to, to be able to speak to Angelina, who is, as you say, one of the preeminent journalists in Ukraine and who has been in this country, in Ukraine, pretty much throughout the war. Angelina is a very, very brave journalist as well. And um, what I'd like to start by asking Angelina, so I was in Ukraine for about a month, a month and a half, month and a bit, if you count Poland. I left mid-May, so it's been about a month now, slightly longer. What I'd really like to know, Angelina, especially in light of all the stuff we're hearing outside of Ukraine, that the tide is turning, that Russia is, is, is perhaps starting to gain, what has the, the progress been like over the last few weeks, specifically over the last month? Thank you, David, for the kind words and always a pleasure to, to speak to you and thank you, Fan Club, for having me. Uh, I think it's important to understand that even though for the past months, the latest like big news from the front line is that we do not actually control, control Severodonetsk anymore, there are no major, no major news about the Russian Russian breakthroughs in Donbass or in the south, I think it's really, really important to understand because with, with all the dynamic, with all the missiles, with all the mi weaponry, you know, used by, by the Russian army, there have been some different, you know, prognosis during, during this past month. So the latest and the biggest update is, of course, that we, I hope, temporarily have lost control over Severodonetsk by withdrawing our forces from the town that was under, you know, heavily bombardment. Um, and um, our journalists are rotating from time to time. I mean, each week, almost each week or two weeks, we have a crew working, working in Donbass, in Lysychansk, which we still control. There's heavy battles in, in Lysychansk. But the fact is that um, the, the way the Russians are operating there on the ground is that they actually, they are burning down each square meter of Ukrainian positions while the Ukrainian army is counting each missile. So the, the dynamic mm, with all that looks the following, looks like the following, that the Russians are using all the weaponry that they have, the heavy artillery, the you know air bombardments, uh, rocket missiles, and everything that they have um, on each square meter to push away the Ukrainians. And they have gone as far as Lysychansk so far. Of course, I mean, if we look just at the front line, it seems like not, not so much, you know, not, not so much. But on the other hand, uh, and Olha has started with it, each day Ukrainian cities across the whole country are, are attacked. And in, in this regard, you know, even one day, one day is critical, not even a month. You see, yesterday we had a small town of Kriminchuk, which is on the you know, on the border of Dnipropetrovsk and, and Poltava region, uh, heavily attacked with probably dozens of people dead. Uh, a civilian object was bombarded. Um, there is um, uh, another rocket hit um, a, a machine, uh, which was not far from this um, shopping mall. But the fact is that uh, this factory hasn't been producing any sort of 
um, military vehicles or any sort of equipment for the military vehicles since 1989. And, you know, again, uh, thinking about that and thinking of a perspective of other attacks, this is a very, very uh, dangerous situation in any part of the city, in any part of the country, be it, you know, west, western part, be it Kiev. And with all that, I don't know if you left in May, if you have witnessed how many Ukrainians went back home from European countries um, and also uh, back to Kiev from other Western cities because, well, people, people want to get back home. They want to, you know, take care of their families, take care of their homes, pets, get back to work. It's also a financial matter. Um, this, is, this is a serial, serial matter because three days ago, uh, Kiev also was bombarded. Uh, there was a missile that hit uh, that hit a residential house, uh, killing a 37 year old uh, man and injuring his wife and, and seven year old daughter. So it's, it's the reality of each day. Uh, in this case, you know, each day is uh, several dozen, sometimes several dozen lives, lives of civilians, sometimes hundreds and counting, counting the lives of the military. You know, it's, it's critical each day or even each hour. I think, thank you for that. I mean, that's a really good sort of summation of everything. I mean, look, what really struck me when I, when I went, I sort of, I was sort of, we were talking earlier, I tried to go to all of the fronts. So I went to the south, I went to Mikolaev and beyond to see the southern front. I went to the Donbass in the east and I went up to Kharkiv in the northeast. And what really struck me is the morale of the Ukrainian troops. You know, none of, no one was interested in surrendering and territorial compromise. Everyone was convinced they were going to win, you know. Now, you may say, oh, well, they're going to put on a brave face for a foreign journalist, but it's not always the case, and you can tell. So what really struck me is the morale, right, which obviously these are people fighting to defend their country. The second thing, and this is, you know, this is something I think that we need to address. You rightly talk about the tragic and, and you know, needless loss of Ukrainian lives because of this, because it's essentially unprovoked Russian aggression. But to those in, in the West and abroad who think that perhaps this is, a way that the Russians might, you know, force Ukrainians to surrender. I think it's important to point out that Ukraine is it's not even called up, called people up yet. There's no mobilization. You know, there is no full draft in the country, is there? These, these are people who are going are all volunteers, exactly as you say. You know, there is no conscription yet. So I think that, you know, it seemed to me while I was there that, you know, the cost is, is terrible, that the Ukrainian forces are still, and the people are still resolved. You know, I mean, what really strikes me about, about this whole thing is that Putin got the reverse of everything he wanted. He wanted to destroy Ukrainian national feeling. He created it to, to, to heights it never been. And, you know, I'm not Ukraine. I really want your opinion on this. He wanted to make the country militarily weak. It's never been stronger. He wanted to cement orthodoxy. The Ukrainian church broke away. He wanted to divide the West. He has, for the moment, united. So I'm really interested in this kind of law of unintended consequences. And there's something I want to ask you about. And I've asked hundreds of Ukrainians of this over the years, but only I have my thoughts, but I'm not Ukrainian. Only you can answer this. But it seems to me that the country got, became an independent, became a state in 1991. But it seems to me that it became a nation, you know, since 2014. Is this your war of independence? Even though you technically had it in 1991, because I'm an outsider, but I've been going there for eight years. I'm really interested in this idea that this is in, in effect your war of independence. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Uh, well, indeed it is on one hand. On the other hand, it's, it's, it's a war for existence. Uh, it's, it's not just merely, merely, I mean, independence is everything mm. to us, but it's, it's, it's a war not against any political group. Yeah. So, um, some specific uh communities in ukraine uh, wishing to do something it's not a war against elements in the country it's a war against the you know the, the the mere fact of being ukrainian so all of us are targets just for the mere fact of being uh ukrainians this is this is probably the most uh the most important to, to stress but I want to get back to the back to to, to morale uh on one hand of course it's something that keeps keeps the keeps the country and keeps the society strong and mobilized but on the other hand on the other hand it's exhausting i mean it's exhausting in terms of finances it's exhausting yeah. just physically 
to uh, to be in the state of, of, of war and high mobilization uh, for several months now uh, and quite soon half half a year um, we um, I don't know if, if you were following several days ago you together by smaller donations money for three biractars <laughs> and that's a lot of money for Ukraine I mean that's several hundred millions uh, grievances later on the company uh, this, uh, to, be, to give away to Ukrainians this, uh, to present to Ukrainians sort of <clears throat> uh, the, these biorectars. But on one hand, I mean, we, we do have internal resources to do that. We raise money very quickly. We help each other. Uh, we stay in touch. We volunteer um, extensively. But on the other hand, we need to understand that, I mean, you cannot do it uh, people at certain point will face Ukraine at certain point will face economic problems and uh, with with all the attacks against civilian infrastructure you know gas stations factories um, civilian objects uh, infrastructure like railway stations and and, and bridges uh, and and the roads it's not going to make life of Ukrainians easier and it's really important for the world to understand that even though we are capable of mobilizing, you know, raising money and doing everything, uh, there's still uh, a necessity for, for very, very strong support for Ukraine. And there will be a necessity even more um, in the future because we need- What do you to, need, Angelina? What do you I need? Mean, yes, I mean, we, it's, it's such a simple thing. I mean, we will need the bridges, we will need the hospitals, we will need the schools and the kindergartens. The autumn is coming. Many people are thinking, where are they gonna uh, give away their children? Uh, whether the kindergartens will work, whether the schools will work, whether the hospitals will work. With, with that uh, Russian tactics of uh, attacking civilian um, objects, uh, it's, it's, it's a huge question of security. So many need to think, you know, I, I talk now to the parents of many kids who have these internal discussions in their classrooms and their schools, whether they should need whether they should need to raise money for bomb shelters, for example, something that some schools in Ukraine they just merely they don't have or kindergartens. So there, there's a lot and a lot to um, consider in the future in terms of resources that Ukrainians will need, and of course we we spend everything that we have right now for support for. Uh, even though, I mean, even though our army is way, way better equipped than it used to be, best equipped than it used to be for years, still each family would buy something for the soldier, a better helmet, a better pair of shoes, you know, uh, something for the regiment, be it, I don't know, some underwear, sometimes it's a car, really, like the families are buying cars. So it's it's something that we will keep on doing anyway. The state is just... It's, it's impossible for the state to equip everyone with everything. Yeah. So, so I'm really, and I think this is something that our viewers will be very interested in. So this is actually what first struck me years ago. And in my book, 140 Characters, I have a character called the Facebook Warrior. And I talk about the virtual state. Now, you know, and we talk about exactly, so, you know, Ukraine, to, to people who don't really know, it's quite a, it's a horizontal, not a, not a vertical country, you know. It's really, you know, this is why even had the Russians taken Kiev, you know, resistance would have continued throughout because it's quite a diffuse, decentralized country. And, you know, I was on, you know, when I was in Donbass, uh, I was up by um, Lebanese and all those places with an Ukraine battalion who, who used to as well. And I remember speaking to the soldier demon. He said to me, the only thing the government gave me is my gun and its bullets. Everything else was crowdfunded and donated. So I think it's worth really sort of ramming home like, how this is a citizen's war, right? I don't think people still realize the degree to which the Ukrainian army is funded by, by the very people that are already struggling, as you say, for all these other, other reasons. I think it's really important. Indeed. And, you know, we have this joke that Ukrainians can raise money. If Ukrainians can raise money over a short time for three biorectars, probably they need to start to start raising money for for a nuclear bomb. You know, it's it's it, like it's a funny joke. It's, it's a funny joke on one hand, but on the other hand, um, it's not a gun that you're fighting in this war. Uh, you've been to the front lines and you've seen that this is a war where you don't really use a gun. It's a heavy artillery. 
so the, the, the this war works like that. You need to have tanks, you need to have military vehicles, you need to have high marshes, you need to have rocket launchers, missile launchers, and, and stuff like that. It's not about having a gun, actually. Mm -hmm. So even though the state is capable of giving you a gun and bullets, it's not really a fact that a soldier would use it in this in this kind of war with with, with heavy artillery, with air bombardments, of uh, and, and, and things like that. Yeah. So no, sure, no, absolutely. It's the sort of crowdfunding element of it that I find very interesting. So look, I mean, as things as, as things progress, you know, as things get worse, because it seems to me that, you know, it's probably in. We'll never say never, but you know, it's unlikely the Russians can can defeat Ukraine militarily now. From what we're hearing, there's going to be a big push toward the south. But what they can do, I guess. Is try and sit on the country and uh, economically, as you talk about. You know, Odessa is a wonderful place. I was just there. In the summer, it usually has lots of tourists. You're not going to have tourists coming when there's air raids and they're firing missiles. So, are we entering that phase where Russia just tries to slowly strangle Ukraine because it failed to defeat it militarily? And what needs to be done? Because it's more than just assistance. Then there needs to be political action at, at the international level. Wouldn't you say? And if so, what? In order to have political action, you need to have your societies and your audiences informed. I think the world is, of course, the world's eye is on Ukraine right now, and the foreign media are doing just an extremely great job by covering what is happening. But um, on one hand, it's part of the world. On the other hand, we understand it's a breaking news situation. So it really lacks, is, as in any breaking news situation, it really lacks context. And uh, the story that is unfolding in front of our eyes right now, in front of the whole world, actually, uh, is, is the story of the, up, of, of the coming famine. Uh, and uh, it's a story that would involve many countries of the global south. And we need to make sure, I mean, that was one of the discussions that I recently had with, with my colleagues from Philippines, Brazil, Mexico, you know, Latin America, and um, India, uh, we were actually talking about the fact that the countries of the global south will be affected most by this, you know, crisis caused by by the Russia's war uh, against um, against Ukraine. And what the world needs to know is the context and implications uh, of what Russia is doing in Ukraine. The grain story, I mean, the story of the blocked ports um, in Ukraine and the necessity to uh, well, to make sure that the grain comes out and it's the Ukrainian grain, it's, it's not the grain that Russia is uh, actually stealing from, from Ukraine and buying because there are well, some investigations and, and some media are saying that this is actually the fact that is happening right now. That is the story that the world also need, needs to look right now and to understand what are the connections between, because it's not only about you know, Russia attacking Ukraine in some far away part of the world. Um, and uh, this is something that we really need, need, need to think about. Recently, I, uh, I listened to a wonderful lecture by Professor Timothy Snyder, who started his speech with famine of 1933. And uh, it's a story that is very badly known to the world, the way the Soviet Union and Stalin starved millions of Ukrainians to death just because they didn't want to be part of the Soviet Union. And um, this story like, is giving exactly the context of repeated crimes by, by well, let's, let's call it Russian empire, uh, by, by the colonialism, which is like in the case with uh, Global South, like, you know, double colonialism, uh, something that we could really think about and engage uh, more media from, from glo Global South, taking a, look, a closer look at Ukraine and uh, specifically at this story. So I'd like to actually, so I am actually off to Africa this, this evening. Um, I'd like, yeah, I mean, I've been working on the grain story for a while. I think what has happened here, and exactly as you say, Andrew, is that people need to understand that this, you know, Africa is the latest front of Russia's war against Ukraine. It just is. What we're seeing, looking at what's happening in Africa, is Russia saying, you are not getting your grain. It's because of Ukraine, but not just because of you, it's because of you, the Western NATO. And they're doing two things. First of all, they're saying that this crisis is because of the West. And the second thing they're doing, let's not forget, that Russia is an exporter of grain as well. It's a Ukraine is a competitor. So what it's doing is it's stealing, it's, it's blocking Ukraine, right? it's stealing Ukrainian grain, relabeling it as Russian, and then turning up to places like Egypt and saying, look, your, your grain is blocked because of the West and Ukraine, but look, we're giving Ukraine, we're your saviors. 
Now, I was in Africa in February when the war started. And I remember being in Ghana, in Accra. And it was the most incredible thing. I saw on these electronic billboards in Accra, the capital of Ghana, the Ukrainian flag. I've never seen such soft power of a country in my life, apart from maybe the US, uh, to a lot less degree Britain. And, you know, there was real outpouring of support for Ukraine. Now, what Russia is banking on and what I fear is, you know, let's see how long that support lasts when people say, well, you're not getting your grain. And bear in mind, not all grain is for, is for bread. A lot of it's for animal feed and the animals will die. So I think you raise a really important point because, and it comes, I think, to the point that we were discussing earlier, which is this, is that as Russia is defeated on the battlefield as it was in the, the push for Ukraine, it's going to use other things. Inside Ukraine, it's just going to start pounding the cities, trying to kill as many civilians as possible to defeat Ukrainian morale. But outside, it's going to be doing things like this. And I mean, you know, can you imagine leveraging the potential of famine as a weapon? I mean, it's just abhorrent beyond anything. But here we are. So I think this is where you're absolutely right, Angelina. People need to understand that actually what is happening, the problem is I'm looking at African media spaces and those narratives are working, you know, especially in places like Africa where there's strong you know, colo anti-colonialism, anti-imperialism sentiment, understandably, they're saying, once again, your pawns in, West, in the West's games. So people need to understand that this is, as I like to call it, the latest front in the Russian war on Ukraine. And, and let's be honest, the war on the West. I'd like to talk to you about something else now. I'd like to ask you about something slightly broader. Now, you know, there's a lot of talk, and I've, you know, I've, or I've been to, or covered a lot of wars. I've, I've, I've sort of looked at many conflicts. And there's a lot of cliches spouted, a lot of things that are glib. that aren't really true, but I think in this case, it is true. I think... When people say that Ukraine is, is not just fighting for Ukraine, but fighting for the West or, or Europe, I think that's true because, look, if I think what is being hammered out on the battlefields of Ukraine now is not just the future of Ukraine and Russia, but the future of the West. And I say this because if, if Ukraine had folded in three days, like Putin's arselickers told him it would, then they'd be halfway to Georgia and Moldova by now, because why wouldn't they, right? Why wouldn't they? So I really want to talk to you about the wider importance. Yes, we understand the problem. You know, this matters for Ukraine, this matters for human rights. But I'd like you to really sort of talk about why does this matter for anyone that's interested in the safety of Europe, the security of Europe, and the security of, of the broader Western alliance? Well, that's a really good question. Um, for, for us as journalists, let, let me think it, you know, in the perspective of journalism and media work that we're doing, uh, because I, I think that's that's essential. Uh, wh what we've seen and what we've witnessed is that, indeed, when you're living far away from the front line, it's hard for you to feel what it is really like to be under a missile attack, what it is like to go downstairs, you know, several times uh, a day and stay in a bunker for, for several, uh, several hours, what it is like to not have water or, or medicine or anything like that. We really faced it during these eight wars when uh, the war, um, the Russian war against Ukraine was sort of um, contaminated, you know, was contained contained uh, in, in eastern part of the country in Donbass. So the rest of the country had a chance to live their no normal lives. And I can understand why the rest of the world and Europe you know, some Western European countries like Germany and France and other countries, they don't, they don't really feel this uh, threat so, so close to them. But um, this is also, I, I really need to stress it, but this is also an ethical question. Um, we understand that the, the heating season is coming and that the uh, discussion, for example, in Germany may change critically in favor of, you know, maybe Ukraine and Russia sit down and think because, you know, our, our, uh, our bills on uh, heat uh, and, and gas will become higher. So why the German people will need uh, to, you know, pay more for gas when Ukraine doesn't want to talk to Russia, something like that. This is one of the Russian narratives and it is working and we know it will, it, it, it will work obviously further on. But Thinking about the ethics, I think that the European countries need to understand what they are willing to pay for, for their peace. In our case, you know, these discussions look like Ukrainian life or thousands of lives are cheaper than, you know, a pay, pay bill for gas. I mean, is, is, that, is that the European value that uh, 
that many millions, millions of people were fighting for for, for for centuries, actually. So it's a good discussion for European societies. What is their sacrifice for this war, which is not just merely Ukrainian war, as you pointed out. It's, 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 a, it's a war for European values. It's, I mean, it's a sovereign state. It's a sovereign state that... Um, this, that was in the progress of reforming itself, and by the way, successfully reforming itself in, in many, many uh, spheres and on the way to the Euro European Union. Uh, it's, it's a state that actually started the process of negotiating with, uh, with, with their people in the occupied territories. It's a state that was willing to solve its, its own problems that was brutally attacked just, just like that. So a question for the European um, societies that are quite far, and it's understandable that it is quite hard for you to understand what it is like to live in, in conditions like that. Uh, but it's, it's the job of, of, you know, the, the, it's the job of the local media, it's the job of, of the local European writers, intellectuals to raise this discussion. What is our... Uh, sacrifice for that if it's if it's a gay uh, it's a, a gas uh, pay bill or if it's something else that we are ready to sacrifice for that and in case with ukraine it's thousands and thousands of lives yeah and i mean look i think that yeah you, know, you talk about the gas not only is it more abhorrent but you know we have i mean there's an issue for, for europe here europe is going through an energy crisis and it's going through an energy crisis now because it gets its energy from a rogue state like we understood with China and COVID and supply chains, you cannot rely on rogue states. And it is in Europe's interest, you know, apart from the environmental aspects, to get themselves off Russian gas and, uh, and oil because they will suffer and the Russians will use it. You know, millions of people beyond Ukraine are going to be suffering this winter. And it is because of Russian aggression. There are other factors, sure, so post COVID stuff, but the Russians deliberately before the war uh, reduced the supply of natural gas in, into the stockpiles in order to essentially stoke the um, the conditions for where we are now. So I think that, you know, the importance of this, you know, to Europe is on so many levels. It's, yes, issues of sovereignty. Yes, it's the security of its eastern flank. It's also about energy. It's also about, in the end, can you rely on rogue states for vital supplies? And the fact is that you can't. So uh, look, I mean, exactly. and, Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it's, 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 a, it's also a question of political responsibility, which... Which, which, which is out there for the European societies to, to deal with. I mean, Ukraine should not become the one to blame for it. I mean, uh, one of the fears is that with, with that energy crisis coming, uh, there might be like a you know, pressure against Ukraine to sit down and negotiate with Russia, which, which is at, at, that, at this very uh, specific moment, doesn't seem like like a solution because there, there's nothing nothing to negotiate i mean apart from the fact that we need to exchange our people that there are some humanitarian things that we still can negotiate as in every war um negotiations just generally on on this war don't really seem possible because again as i as i said earlier it's a war for it's, it's a war against the mere fact of Ukraine being a state, so you, you cannot negotiate your existence. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I mean, see, this is my concern, you know, um, you know, the Ukrainians have, and actually it's a very interesting lesson in, in power politics, and it's a very sad one, which is that, you know, people love a winner, and we, we think, oh, the West has been so great in supporting Ukraine, they have, but it was only after the Ukrainians, it became clear that they were really starting to win and to beat the Russians back, that the, the, the people were happy to sort of support. I think had the Ukrainians, so ironically, had Ukraine really needed the support more than it does, it probably been less forthcoming. But once the Ukraine, we saw with Afghanistan, you know, everyone just started running for the hills. But look, I mean, this is this is to me, as, and it keeps going back to, to to my point of what I saw. You know, and I said I went to all the three fronts. You know, you you've seen them all as well. It is clear, and we don't know, but at least the first stage, the military battle was lost by Russia. I mean, you go in to take Kiev and take the country and you fall back, that's a defeat. But now the game has shifted. We've talked about bombing those cities. We've talked about the grain, but there's something else, you know, is that the Russians know that media cycles, news cycles are fickle things, right? Eventually, you know, tension will wane. And look, you know, I don't, I don't blame people, you know, who, who've got rising energy bills in, in Paris and London and Berlin or whatever, and they've got four kids. The Russians are banking on the fact that tension is going to drop. New cycles are going to move on and people are going to start to forget. 
Now, that to me, I think, is a really big challenge now. And I think this is why events like this, Penn, is so important that we keep that, that going. And, I, and so what I want to ask you now is, like, at what, you know, what, what level, at the level of the people watching this, you know, the average engaged European, perhaps American citizenry, what do you need from them? Because it seems to me that they will be important because they'll, you know, we need politicians to be held to account. We need this to keep being, even if not the top of news, in the public consciousness. Because as soon as it slips, what Russia is banking on, that's when they're going to start trying to get back in, lift those sanctions, bring countries back to, companies back to, to Moscow and so on. You know, one of my uh, one of my colleagues in France recently made a good point. Uh, we're not here to entertain you. I mean, to to to, to keep your attention uh, to to what is happening in Ukraine. I mean, that, that we're not we're not entertaining entertaining oh. the world with it. I know it sounds cynical, but this is how this business work. And of course, we as as, as journalists and as media, we're, we're thinking about it. But um, the thing is that, let me get back to the point about context and knowing uh, Ukraine. It is really important to understand what country you're covering. And um, uh, unfortunately for many global media, Ukraine was, has been for, for, for decades uh, a region that was covered from head offices in Moscow. You know, very, very, um, Occasionally, when there is an election, when there is a revolution, when there is, I don't know, Eurovision Song Contest or something more, you know, exotic or sexy coming. So it's not like the presence of, of the global media was, was here for a long time and uh, many media really understood what Ukraine is about. I think this, on one hand, this is a really tragic reason for um, for many media and for many uh, global media to move, actually, uh, move in Ukraine. Yes, some of the global media offices opened their bureaus here and they decided that they will work uh, on a regular basis, which is, a great, uh, which is great news, even though we understand this is also because they were kicked out of Moscow. There is no opportunity for major um, global media to work and... Uh, unless the regime is changed or the circumstances are changed, of course, with, with the, any first chance coming, many of them will still go to Moscow. It's understandable. Uh, but at the same time, Ukraine is not only about war. And this is a very, very important point. I mean, Ukraine is a very interesting democracy. And with, in, in many countries facing cr crisis of democracy, crisis of trust, you know, uh, crisis of trust in institutions, Ukraine is sort of an experimental hub for many practices and for many, for many things that could be really, really sort of work as fresh air for, for many societies and many countries. Uh, you, you already pointed out that uh, Ukraine is a, is a strongly dis decentralized country. This is a, a very interesting and very important point to make um, that covering Ukraine and covering Ukrainian war, it's not only a story of total suffering and victimization, things like that. As our society is, um, is, is compiled of very interesting and sometimes paradoxical horizontal ties. For example, during the war, we could see that former enemies, political foes, you know, business foes formed these unlikely alliances, which were really great and interesting and, 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 and interesting to look at. Um, so uh, it's a very interesting mix of civil society, volunteering, working with local authorities, working with central authorities. And it's a very interesting mix of um, interaction between different religious, national uh, communities, where you would have, you know, LGBTQI community supporting Azov regiment and other things. That is really, really, really um, interesting. And I think lots of stories are missing from, from this war coverage because, of course, what media are drawn with is suffering, is death and blood. I mean, we know how it works. But on the other hand, so many stories um, still to cover and so many regions still to go and to see. Uh, plus, you need to understand that apart from the fact that this brutal war is, is in progress in Ukraine, Ukraine is still operating as a state. I mean, companies are working, people are going to work, yeah. um, people are, you know, helping each other, volunteering, doing lots of things. 
you know, lots of interesting places are open and apart, uh, despite the fact that there's huge threat all the time, this is also part of a normal and very interesting life to cover. I mean, absolutely. I mean, what struck me, so I, Odessa was my base. And, you know, we'd go to various places, come back and how climatized, well, you know this from Kiev, you know, the air raids. You know, it's just life goes on and you have this mixture of tension, but life goes on because what choice do they have, especially if you're Ukrainian? Because, my God, someone said to me, you know, a Ukrainian friend of mine said, any Ukrainian born at any point in the last hundred years at some point would have had to fight for their existence, essentially. Uh, and nothing is changing. Uh, I mean, I, I know we're sort of getting toward the end of the discussion, but how do you, I mean, this is slightly, let's strip away you as a political analyst, as a journalist, as, as everything else. Let's just, like Angelina, as a Ukrainian, how do you feel? You talk about being exhausted. I mean, how, how, we, I, you must be, feel immense pride. I feel pride in the Ukrainian performance, and I'm not even Ukrainian. How do you feel about all of this? What does it make you feel? There must be a lot of different emotions. And what is your, what do you think about things going forward? Are you hopeful? Are you, I mean, obviously you're cautious. How do you feel, I guess? Well, on one hand, uh, being exhausted, that's on physical part. I mean, exhaustion is what, what comes with sleepless nights, you know, with, uh, uh, with, 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 uh, with the need uh, to keep, keep in touch with so many people in so many dangerous places. But on the other hand, and uh, this is what I really, this, this argument that I really uh, wanted to share with lots of my colleagues, what I do in, in journalism, apart from the fact that I'm Ukrainian and it makes me just immensely proud of, of my nation and, and my country and my society, is that journalism is, is hugely empowering. It's something that really gives sense to what we're doing because what you see around yourself is so many senseless and tragic deaths and, and just tragedies around you, but you know that you you need to cover them, you need to, to talk ab about them, you need to give context, you need to explain to the world what are the implications and, and, and you need to do that job. Uh, so on one hand, of course, it's exhaustion, but on the other hand, it's, it's a feeling of mobilization and empowerment. That's me, you know, translating feeling proud <laughs> because yeah. proud, of course, is something that probably all of the Ukrainians are uh, Feeling, but that, that's a that, that's a bit complicated um, uh, feeling. On the other hand, um, I mean, having and uh, seeing how many people from my generation, in their thirties, in their forties, in their twenties, are getting killed, and I, I need to say that these are the best people of of our generations, the best people who were you know, doing their best during Maidan, doing their best with anti-corruption initiatives, doing their best with fighting, you know, uh, criminal circles, ecological initiatives. I mean, you just look at these people who were brave enough not to stay home or to leave the country or just stay away from what is happening. They are getting killed in the first place. Each week I have someone whom I dearly, whom I know and I, I, I respect or whom I love. Uh, these people are getting injured or killed uh, each week. And yeah. I know, I understand that with all that dynamics, with, with the war still in progress, there will be more, more of the people whom I know, more of the most capable people of Ukraine just dying, dying dying out there and uh, i don't want to you know finish on a note like that um because i'm still uh, it's, it's it's still important what we do and it's i mean we don't have other options but to fight and it's it's always like that that the best and the most courageous are are doing that but it's also important for the world to understand that each day each day of this war is is killing you know someone who, who brought so many changes in this country. It's, it's killing a universe that will never come back. And it's a huge tragedy for us. It's something that really, I mean, we are mobilized, we're, we're doing work with what we do, but there is also so much anger, so much anger uh, among Ukrainians for, for what the Russians are doing, killing the best of us. 
Yeah, and I think that's really a really important point. I mean, the one thing I will say is, you know, I think in 2014, if you'd asked a lot of people in England, they wouldn't have been able to tell you or America what a Ukraine was. Now everybody knows Ukraine, right? All over the world. And, you know, if they don't know anything about Ukraine, they know one thing, they do not want to be a part of Russia. You know, I mean, this is the real birth of a global nation here that, that I've seen as someone who's been coming on and off for eight years to the country. And, and, and it is, I mean, look, again, it's, it's, you know, when I, when I came in the aftermath of my dad, Angie, when we first met, and what struck me then was what was always Ukraine's thing was human capital, right? It was civil society then as it was. You know, if I'm asking the, the TV station that you, that you joined, you were a part of, you were, you were there from the beginning. And it was that civil society that, that went into my book, right? These were the people, and like young Ukrainians, smart, multilingual, educated, generally very good with tech. You know, I always say the Ukrainians are coming and it's a horrific thing, but I just see the birth of a nation formed in blood and war, but it is a, a, a strong, powerful, self-confident, culturally aware nation that is emerging. It has a lot of problems. Like, you know, there's huge financial problems. And you have these this huge state sitting on you know sitting on you and trying to strangle you but i mean through all of the the, the, the heartache you know we hope that something that something positive and something great is going to emerge and i, and I think that it is and i say as someone who, who, who is british who's western we thank you all honestly all of you like it's incredible what i've seen over the years it really is okay thank you right right that's uh, hey Olya, how are you Thank you. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you, our great speakers, for this. And thank you again for a lot of important and very realistic com uh, you know, insights, giving our viewers more details on what is going on and describing the reality of occupied territories, but also the position of Ukraine in the world, like discussing the energy crisis, food crisis, supply chain crisis, mentioning Africa as the latest front of Russia's war against Ukraine and the meaning of propaganda in this context as it's not so obvious for everybody. And we have one question from our viewer, Jadwiga McKay. How big is the concern about possible territorial loss as a result of war? Uh, the concern is huge. Uh, and actually, th this is a very good question because as you were uh, listing all the things that we've discussed, I, I thought that we've missed a very, very important point about the occupied territories. You know, there is... Um, there is an argument in, in, in Russian um, narrative, in the propagandistic narrative, uh, or you know, even among some Europeans who are quite far away from this war, saying that, listen, why do you have to fight so fiercely for some of your territories? Th these fightings are clearly just, you know, exterminate people like in Mariupol. Why wouldn't you just give up Mariupol and then save lives? And in this, in, in this, like, uh, in this regard, act more humanistically. I mean, I know this. Th there is this argument, and it's, it's sometimes I, I also get these questions from some of, 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 of the Europeans. But what is important is that you know when when the Russians left Bucha, we saw what they do in the occupied territories. After Bucha, if people in Kherson, I mean, I personally, I started to get calls from people in Kherson who were also at that moment uh, under, under approaching uh, occupation or already under occupation asking me, oh my God, what, what are we going to do? They, they are going just to exterminate us, just, you know, look for, for the activists, look for uh, journalists, look for former veterans, just kill people on the streets what are we going to do with that so the world needs to know it's not about you know it's not about fighting for the land for the territories it's fighting for the people who are getting killed just for nothing like they did hundreds of lives in Bucha just people who were going to get some water people who were just crossing the street and were killed with military vehicles and it's it's really important to to explain to the world that it's it's not about the territories of course it is it is but it's about the people who are living in these territories, and these are Ukrainians, our co-patriots. Thank you very much for this response, and we have one more, uh, more future looking. What do you realistically, realistically envision for the rebuilding of Ukrainian society once a good peace is achieved? You mentioned it quite a few times, but still. 
Uh, I mean, there's so much work that we will need to do. There are whole cities that are wiped off the earth's face, like Mariupol, Volnavaha, like uh, Borodanka, and other places that we need to renovate. It's it's billions and billions of of uh, any currency you take, euros, dollars. It's so much work. It's so much hands, so many hands that we need. So it's huge. It's huge work. But on the other hand, I mean, David, we were talking about it briefly. What is there to, I mean, what is there to connect? How can we talk to the world so that the world could connect to the story and engage with the story? I mean, cynically calling the war in Ukraine a story, but still for the media, it is a story. It's also talking to the world how the world was renovating itself after wars and conflicts. And there are so many parts of the world that have good uh, you know, experience in uh, renovating cities and, 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 and whole countries and regions and provinces. And we still have to talk to each other about things that we could share and the work that we can do together. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think um, Angelina sums it up perfectly. Ukraine needs a Marshall Plan. That's what we need to, to go forward. And it'll be something that will benefit the entire region. You know, it just reminds me of my favorite meme. And you know that Ukrainians are really good in it of the last days that they say that to be successful, you need to step out of the comfort zone. And now we have at least 40 millions of people who did right so ukraine has no chance but to be successful and i in this context i want to highlight another important question angelina raised that can you in this whole context negotiate your own existence i guess we already know the answer subconsciously based on the number of ukrainian flags all around the world including africa by the way right Absolutely. ukraine is not only about the war is as you said kind of experimental hub and great learning platform. Yep. This is very interesting, unique, horizontal society, this mix of religion, national national communities, sometimes quite paradoxical, right? But yep. still inspiring. Yep. And covering Ukrainian war, it's not only to write about suffering and losses, but also a great story of bravery, pride, and very inspiring people. And this is what our conversations are about to try to find the answer to the question, what can I do today? And today, our dear viewers, I would say, remember that Ukraine fighting not for itself only, but for the whole West, its values, democracy, freedom, and think. What are you personally keen to pay? Does your bill for gas cost human life? What are you ready to sacrifice? And I will leave you here to think, as this war is not about Ukraine only. We're grateful to our speakers for today's conversation. We're grateful to our partners for their help. The project is implemented with the support of the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine and our traditional partners, Pan America, the Ukrainian Institute, the Ukrainian Institute London, Ukraine World, the Harvard University Ukrainian Research Institute, and the Harman Institute at Columbia University. We are streaming the event to all partners' Facebook page. Please do share. Gratitude, of course, to Pan Ukraine, which continues to stand at the front lines in the name of freedom and truth. Pan International is proud to be a platform that supports freedom of expression. We hope those dialogues give you enough insights and material for deep thinking. Thank you again, dear speakers. That was pure pleasure. Thank you, our viewers. The next episode will be broadcast on July 5 at 6 p.m. Kiev time, 4 p.m. London time. And our special guest, this time literary stars, will be Orhan Pamuk, Turkish novelist, screenwriter, academic and novelist. Yes, please come. I found this, <laughs> sorry, in the, the ruins of a bombed out building in Kharkiv. And I took it. Ukraine will rise again from the ashes. Okay. Thank you, Dad. Sorry to interrupt you. Please continue. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for that. Those are, you know, small but really meaningful acts. <laughs> and back to our guests for next works cast, Sophia Andrukovic, great Ukrainian writer and translator. So follow our dialogues on war, spread the word, and stand with Ukraine. This is our shared responsibility today. Thank you. Bye.
Bye-bye.